Welcome to another episode of Sell Me This Pro. It is our second episode ever, so just a quick reminder what we're doing here is my friend B-Dog, who you can see on your screen right now. What's up, B-Dog? Hey, how's it going? I'm good, I'm good. I'm explaining to everyone what the show is all about. B-Dog commentates a stack of Tier 2 and Tier 3 Counter-Strike, which means he has constantly got his eye on all the new up-and-coming players. Uh, he also does all sorts of different regions. He's up all hours of the night, so he can really give us insight. And the idea behind the show is he's going to tell us about some of the names that you probably started to hear in conversations, that you started to see on Reddit and HLTV, and he's going to let us know if basically we should invest in this pro. That's the crux of it. Today, we are focusing on the Brazilian, the young Brazilian kid that everyone's been speaking about for a little while. His name is Snow. Before we get into that and you try sell me this pro though, B Dog, I was thinking about this before we started the show and I thought it might be nice to kind of explain to everyone where we're going with this and, and where the concept is. So for you, when you're trying to keep an eye out for for a player that you either think that we should be looking at and paying attention to, or maybe there's a player that you think is overhyped. I mean, what is it? that specifically stands out for you that, that gets your attention or, or what is it that you're looking for i think that, that's a really interesting question uh, first off uh wow that's a big one to kind of kick things off with um to be honest when it comes to looking at these players i, I think obviously first off the, the amount of games that they're playing is obviously quite a big one and just sort of the consistency if i if i'm looking at a young guy a lot of the a lot of these players are incredibly young that we're going to be talking about throughout the series and it, it's one of those where if they've already got good principles in place also who have they played with over their career because uh, again th there's some big names that are, are going to come up i'm not going to spoil any of them that we've got coming up in the series but they've played with like some of the region's best already and they're like under 20 years old and it's it's a big sign if they've got trust from respected players in the community already and then obviously the 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 quote unquote eye test of how good they look in certain situations how do they deal with pressure if their team makes a deep run is it a fluke is it a one off is it because of this player doing uh, the correct things or is it just their aim bailing them out of certain situations there's a lot of different factors but specifically when i look at players i always look for consistency and i look for longevity because i think it's really easy to kind of get caught in the hype of some players when they kind of make these blockbuster moves but if they don't really have the track record then it can kind of be a little bit hit and miss and potentially a quote-unquote risky investment to kind of come on the show and say this guy's good because they've joined this team because it isn't always about that is it difficult though making a call like this, especially because a lot yes. of this new talent is so young? You, yeah, I mean, also because you haven't seen them play in different teams. That's always my worry because they might look good in this iteration of a lineup, but it could be very well dependent on the competitions they're playing, the level of the opposition, all of that. The moment you take them out of that space, it it doesn't look so good anymore. Yeah, it it depends on the thing is there's so many variables when a player gets picked up for a team it isn't just their stats look good so we should pick them up it's also what system did this player used to kind of derive from uh you could kind of compare if you take a look at the south american scene for example that region is thriving competitively at the moment i think that is one that, that region right now is in the one of its best states competitively in the last year or so and it's because now you've got these different style of teams it isn't just whole w rush everywhere it isn't sort of the the furia exploding onto the scene as they did all those years ago a lot of people sit like sino so no, i can't say the word uh, a lot of people just kind of like take that that play style and they say that's south american counter-strike and it isn't there are so many different ways to approach it now. A lot of influence from EU has come in, whether that's been coaching background staff, whether that's been from the tournaments that these teams are now moving over and playing. Uh, it's a lot more varied. It's a lot more structured. And it's really interesting to watch. So uh, in terms of the play style, that's kind of what you look at as well. Also, can they just go ahead and take the game by a scruff of the neck? Do they have that confidence at such a young age to have involved impact in a game take responsibility when it's not necessarily theirs like that's really interesting that's a really good quality of someone that's got a longevity in the upper echelons of counter-strike you mentioned the the south american region and it's 
It's a curious one for me because obviously there was a time where they were dominating the global scene, but it's thriving as a region. It's super competitive. We have all these teams there. We're not really seeing them make the massive impact that I suppose South American fans want to see on the global stage. Do you think that is a little bit of them, maybe a little bit of everyone else figuring out that hit W style, but also them trying to evolve their play style as a whole that's kind of holding them back from lifting another trophy? Yes and no, because it also, I think it depends on invites to actually go and compete in some of these events. Can you prove yourself sort of internationally as well? Is there resources for the team and the background to actually send their team to boot camp in Europe? Because we know the practice is better in Europe. Um, I think for Furia, if we just take those as a, just an isolated case, because they're the ones that are competing the most in Tier 1 right now, we know what the problems are there. I mean, there was uh, a lot of sort of background issues uh, just in the background staff. There was a lot of stylistic clashes when Fallen joined initially. Uh, and it's kind of getting out almost the dead wood, as it were, if you want to kind of use a football analogy, where you're kind of cutting the players in the back. You're getting rid of the culture that doesn't necessarily fit with where the roster wants to move forward. And that will takes time. So I think Furia can be on the right path i think they've already shown it immediately at ecw i think skulls is a fantastic pickup and i really like the fact that he has moved to a team where he is being given that trust and sure he went international he tried to give it a go a lot of these players will look to go international to try and make things work because of more opportunities when it comes to playing competitive counter-strike it's just a fact that in europe the competition the skill scene is higher there are more opportunities so we've gone completely off on a tangent, but it's fun. Yeah. Uh, and I think that we've answered some questions and, and we're setting the scene nicely for, for that South American region. Final one, we spoke about this in episode one, but I think we need to just recap it. Let's just define exactly how we're separating tier one, tier two, and tier three, because I think that's important. We'll talk a lot about it. Obviously, tier one, we're talking the big, the IEM colognes, the IE, uh, IEM caddos, you know, your majors, your, your RMRs, those sort of things. That's the kind of level of competition we're talking about when we say tier one, right? Yeah, and it's like teams that are competing at the very top, teams that are potentially partnered as well, which I think the competitive landscape moving forward next year is going to pave the way for some of these South American teams to get invited. I think we're going to be seeing more of Pain, for example. I think we'll be seeing more of like Imperial. Like These teams will make more regular featured appearances. And uh tier one sorry i went off on a tangent again tier one is like <laughs> the top top teams if you go on hltv ranking top 30 easily like tier one you'd even probably condense it down a little bit more and say top 15 top 20 like the, the, those are the boundaries and then below that you take a look at tier two where you, you, tier two is in an interesting spot because people don't really know how to group tier two i, I normally look at tier two being the next step, almost like the bodyguards, the bouncers of the club, where they're the next up, they're the next in to these tier one invites if someone drops out or if there's more spaces to kind of come in. That's where you look at, I put Gamer Legion, sort of like tier 1.5, tier 2, uh, sort of th those scale of teams, right? That, that equivalent. I think even NIP right now is like tier 1.5. So um, that, that's kind of where I rank them. Everything else below that is like tier 2, tier 3, and then it just kind of gets separate all the way down uh, and filtered uh, there's a ton of tiers if you want to break it down but in, in the simplest form tier one sort of best 15 20 teams at the top tier two are probably like the next 30 or so and then beneath that is just like tier three there we go so now you know what we're talking about when we're throwing those tiers around let's get into the pro we want to talk about today uh snow Obviously, by now, you've probably guessed we're talking about South America. Pain's coming up. We're going to talk about this guy. 15 years old was the age he was at when people started, uh, I think, first started writing about him and talking about him and saying, hey, look at this kid. Uh, and he's only 17 now, which is mental for me. Uh, he can't drive in most places. When did he first pop up on your radar, B-Dog? Uh, so he popped up when he was performing in a team called Young Gods, which is Godsense Academy. Uh, he played there for a little bit. They they were competing in some domestic sort of tournaments, but he really jumped onto the scene when I think it was this either season one or season two of We Play Academy when they were holding the events locally and they were doing lands. They would fly these teams out. So 
at the age of 15, Snow and uh, a bunch of other guys from Young Gods went over to Europe, competed in We Play Academy, uh, and that's kind of where he first arrived on the scene for me. And what was it about him that stood out, would you say, right at the beginning there when he was playing it's, with Young Gods? To be honest, it it wasn't actually him that was standing out the most. It, was, it wasn't the so much the individuals on that team. It was actually just getting a, a little look into what the future could hold for South America as a whole. Because it wasn't just Young Gods, there was also Fury Academy. Uh, and what's interesting about this is Fury Academy also had a player on that team competing in We Play called Cowes, who's now Snow's teammate on Pain. Um, but moving in specifically to talk about Snow, uh, what was interesting is it was always very much just Young Gods is very team centric sort of style of play where they would go in together. Don't get me wrong, it was whole W, but they were together. They were sort of, again, the collective is bigger than the sum of the individuals. They were all setting each other up. And I think that was really interesting about Young Gods for me when I was watching them. It wasn't just, we are setting up this flashbang to let our star player go. On that team, everyone was a star player. And everyone can be put in a position, be put in an uncomfortable situation, and sort of bail themselves out with aim or get the support that they needed from their team. What blows my mind is, I think, uh, I don't know if it was Young Gods or Los Grande Academy, or whichever one it was that he played for first, but basically he was picked up because he was just streaming himself playing in packs. Yeah. That was where people were like, hold on, that's the dream, right? Like you're sitting at home, you're like, mom, shut up, I'm very busy, I need to play this game, uh, because look, this team's just picked me up and now I'm getting paid to do it. And that's kind of Brazil for me. Like, I mean, I know yes. what I was saying about how like the, North, the, the South American scene I mean, we want to see them in the sort of top four, and we haven't seen that yet, but there are so many youngsters playing right now competitively coming out of South America, which is insane. And how many of them, they're obviously, I mean, this is a community thing. They're watching streams. They're trying to find this new talent, and they're really developing a community of players that could dominate the space in a couple of years to come. I'm really glad you brought that up because it's a very interesting point for South America in general because in Europe you don't really see that too much. You don't see young young guys that are streaming and get picked up. The only example I can really think of that is probably the, the, the Swedish guy male 09. And, and again, funnily enough, he got picked up by young gods who, who again, it all sort of like links together. But for, for South America, that is a, a legit pathway into a career in esports, which boggles my mind but it just goes to show the community strength because as soon as you get fans you know what it's like in south america if you get a following and if you get guys that are speaking quite highly of you you will get opportunities and obviously best case scenario what we've seen out of this so far i guess is no way no way was a completely unknown entity he got signed to imperial his first professional team imperial all because he streamed that's I can't get over that though. That really isn't. And it's also like just to watch someone playing in a stream though, like that gives you no indication of like what their comms are like, what their no. teamwork is like. You got nothing, right? They're just like messing around on Twitch and you're like, hey, this, there's just raw, t like that old concept of like, we pick you up because you have raw talents. I get it, but it also, what a gamble you take, right? When you find these youngsters and you, you put them in a team environment and you hope it works. Did it work for Snow, though? I mean, I'd argue that it did. I, it, it did, clearly, because he's now one of the, one of the best up-and-coming teams in South America. I, I think it's a really just, not, not so much about Sony this pro, but I think that, in general, the, the pathway, the amount of exposure these guys get and the opportunities that they get it is obviously ingrained in sort of like South American esports culture, but it's really beautiful to know that you can just start doing it by yourself. You've obviously got this dream that you want to be a professional Counter-Strike player. You put the hours in, you showcase yourself to the world. In essence, every single stream that he was doing was almost like a walking advert. Hey, this is what I can provide. This is my individual skill. I would love to go pro. I just need an opportunity. And it's fantastic that there are so many case studies in the South American region where they have taken that gamble. And more often than not, it has worked out. So I think that's just a really nice little testament to the fact that you can do it. You just need to put the work in. And if you're smart and savvy about it, then it can go a long way.
However, don't go tell your parents that you want to just stream all day because you might get picked up by a team. Yeah. Probably won't happen for you. Sorry to shit on your dreams. Okay, so now we see him at these academy teams. We see him at WePlay, and then he gets picked up by Case. So tell me a little bit about that movement for, for Snow. Yeah, so the, the actual journey for him is a bit of an interesting one because from Young Gods, I think they, they basically just dropped their Brazilian roster and they, they wanted to go more in, in line with like Sweden and kind of in line with their national team because the way academy teams were going is they saw the success of Mal's NXT and they were like, oh, okay, well, this could be a feeder team for our next projects. Uh, and I know Godsent have had periods where they kind of dip in and out of between regions. But at that point, Young Gods sort of dissolved. They dropped their uh, South American team. And then he went on to play for Los Grandes. And uh, again, he, he kind of felt a bit unfortunate for the guys in Los Grandes because that was a whole saga where they had their academy team who then became their main team. And then they weren't sure whether they wanted their academy team to be their main team. So then they started moving pieces about and they weren't really sure where they were going to go. There was no clear direction. The picture I'm painting is there was a lot of instability. But in that, I think, shows a level of resilience for Snow. Because he's young. He's, what, 16 at this point? He might still even have been 15. And he's kind of going through all of these sort of organizational battles where all the, all the guy wants to do and all the team wants to do at the moment is just play CS. They're trying to get as many reps in as possible. And to be fair to Los Grandes as an organization, they did put their team in a lot of tournaments. They tried to enter them throughout. There's a lot of domestic sort of games in South America, a lot of tournaments that are now popping up and they continue to thrive. And it's now being featured on HLTV. But before, when they weren't even being featured on HLTV, there's a lot of tournaments you can go and look on Wikipedia that they were competing in. Uh, and from there, he got the offer to join KC Sports uh, or Kase, it's just Casemiro, but however you want to say it. Uh, he got the option to go there. And then from there, his career just took off. And the interesting part about him is when he was playing in that team, he wasn't really playing the star rifle roles. In fact, some of his CT roles were a little bit all over the place. And yet he was still performing really well. Uh, ever since CS2's come out as well, he's had a big uptick in performance. So would you say he wasn't really playing the roles that he suited for when he was in that lineup, even though he was performing? I think he molded himself into those roles. Um, the, the typical roles he was playing, he was, he was playing a lot more star roles, which I think will, is interesting. When you, We'll get onto pain in a minute. But like he was playing outside on Nuke, for example. He was playing long rotate on Inferno on CT side. He uh, was playing like sort of a window connector on Mirage, like typically where you put your best aimers. Uh, and he, he was having a lot of success there, but it took him a, a good few months to properly adapt to it because he, he wasn't playing those roles or, on Young Gods as far as I can remember. I mean, it was like two years ago, but I'm pretty sure he wasn't playing those parts. Obviously now he's there, people start paying attention and I know there was a lot of conversation around him. Uh, there was, I think it was one of the Amer North American organizations super interested in picking him up possibly we could argue that maybe at this point he's a little bit out of their league in terms of talent you would have thought i think it was the wild card move possibly yes. wouldn't have been a great move for him i i don't know if that would have suited what we were looking at with his trajectory and where it was going i, I think the the wild card move is a really interesting one because i don't it would have been a nice opportunity for him because wild cards were at that point where they were thinking about kind of getting some more international offers. They were featuring uh, a lot more prominently towards the, the top end of NA. But comes with that another entire culture shift for Snow, because now you're moving probably out of your home country. You're then having to change language. You'll have to change your roles. There, there's a lot of deviation that would go into that. And then you're playing with some experienced guys on wildcard, but you're also playing with relatively new youngsters the only pull the only significant pull factor i think at that time for him to go to wildcard would have been horvey because horvey as a coach has achieved a lot in his playing career um that kind of goes under the radar and when he joined wildcard i, I know just from uh, like interviews that have been done with him that that team was kind of in disarray and he really had to build it from the ground up he like had to really work on their communication and obviously that would have been a an, an issue for for snow coming forward i think for his development right now it makes a lot more sense for him to stay domestic keep doing keep kept doing what he was doing 
and then get the call up to kind of play with more experienced players in the region that can nurture and sort of develop his ability. They've had all of the reps and continue to gain the reps sort of not only against better teams in Europe, but also right at the top end of SA. And if you can slot into that and perform well, then theoretically your chances are probably a lot better than going to NA and wildcard. While the wildcard conversation is happening, uh, and I remember HLTV reporting on this, they said Payne hijacked the deal. Because out of the blue, yes. Payne comes in and says, we're taking Snow. For me, though, this was the better move, right? Because Payne, we can argue now, I mean, I know that they're the number one rated Brazilian team or were at that point. They are on the up and up. They're a team everyone's paying attention to. Furia at this point is in disarray since they've bought and fallen. Nothing's working there. They have that weird Kai pickup happening, so everyone's ignoring them. MIBR is in Europe trying to do their thing, but Payne is really where the focus is, right? We're all going, this is the, the lineup to follow. And they pick up this youngster at this point. I think he's 16, 17. Um, and this is it. This is where he now, he sits in this Brazilian team, but this is now his opportunity to really rise up to the level that I suppose Payne is expecting from him, but that most Brazilian fans probably want to see as well. I think it was a good move for both parties because at that point, Payne was struggling really to kind of lock down a fifth. Uh, I know they were they're bringing in Nissim from the academy uh, and they were trying to test out different pieces, but none were really working. And suddenly you've got Snow, who is one of the hottest prospects in the market right now. They've already sort of taken Cowes on in that similar vein. And if you kind of draw parallels between the Pain Project and the Wildcard Project, weirdly enough, it's kind of similar because you've got experienced pros such as Biggie Zero and you've got experienced pros in Wildcard. Uh, and then they're also taking a gamble on youth. And that's what Payne did. And they know that the project works because Cowes, whilst when he first joined the team, didn't look that great. He had to adjust to roles, obviously instability with the fifth. These are all external factors that I think people often overlook when you when you kind of just have a look at the team because uh, people most of the time will take it at name value. And they go, this guy is joining one of the best South American projects, South American teams. We expect him to hit the ground running. It doesn't always work like that. Uh, but Payne kind of had that figured out. They knew they wanted to go for a young player. That's why they were testing their academy players. And they, it turns out they can get one of the hottest prospects that is kind of playing on the struggling case team that was doing well, but was doing well by and large because of Snow's performances. So what was it about his performances on, the case, uh, on that case lineup that made him so impressive that everyone was keeping an eye on him? He was pretty much just at times towards the very end just kind of carrying games single-handedly he would walk into situations i remember watching him uh in in ccts where he would actually walk into a site it, it reminded me a lot of and i know this is going to be cringe and i know people are going to overreact in the comments but this is the direct comparison i can draw i am not saying he is like this player that is not what i'm saying but there is very early resemblances of when when Donk was on Spirit Academy. And what I mean by that is because they would both walk into certain situations, they weren't really prepared sometimes to kind of be ready for what was going on in the action, but their aim would bail them out. And in South America, if you've got really good aim, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, that can bail you out and get you a multi-kill. Uh, and Snow was doing that quite a lot on T side. He was taking a lot of space. He was being that guy. He wasn't necessarily the first one in, but he was always guaranteeing the trade. And then he was taking the space. They were gaining the map control and things would flow off the back of it. It made it a lot easier for the IGL to mid round because Case had a lot more space. And even on the CT side, he'd kind of push areas where you'd, you'd look at it and you'd go, you'd raise an eyebrow. Mm, should you be doing that? Not really, but suddenly he's got a multi kill. So it's one of those where he was just, I think, performing probably above where he should have been. But with that being said, it was still impressive nevertheless. And I think Payne look at that and they go, OK, well, if they can calm him down a little bit, if you can sort of blend Snow's style of, well, his rifling's really good, but sometimes he oversteps the mark. Sometimes he goes into fights he doesn't need to be. There's, there's unnecessary risks there. If you can transform that just kind of into what you want to achieve, 
then this pain team becomes really scary. So I imagine that's what they saw in him. You know, B-Dog, all anyone got from that is B-Dog says that Snow is the next dunk. And now no, you're going to get flamed on Reddit for it. No, that's not what I said. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but, you know, we have to just TLDR it. I, I think that what's important, what, what I took away from there is not that this is the next dunk. You're just pointing out that there is a level of confidence that Snow is carrying himself with in a style of play that affords him a position where he can be the difference maker in a game. And that is ideally what you want in a rifler, right? You want that player who isn't afraid to take the jewels, who feels confidence in their aim because ultimately they click heads and that's what you want, right? Yeah, uh, pretty much. And uh, I think with... The again, most simplest it's, it's, way of defining Counter-Strike. Yeah, right I mean, there. It, like, just click bro heads. Walks in, bro walks into a site, he clicks two heads, they win the round. It, like, sometimes it is just as simple as yeah. that. Uh, and and Cowers on Fury Academy was very much the same. Cowers was incredibly aggressive, aggressive to the point where it was certainly too much sometimes. But you could tell the way he positioned himself, he always set himself up for what was next. If he gets a kill, there's always a fallback plan. If he grabs maybe some information and it doesn't really go the way he wanted, at least he's got that information. I'd, ca I'd class him and Snow as very similar players, which is, is why I thought the, the pickup was a little bit interesting at first, because they play similar roles as well. So stylistically, I didn't know how that was going to merge. And I, I still think Payne are trying to figure that out at the moment. So you've had a chance to see them play a little bit. I mean, when you say figuring it out, what have, what, what have you seen from their play style that's made you think, okay, they, they are, are they working on it? Is it going to become a clash down the line? What are your think? What, what is your thinking? It's not going to become a clash because they've, they've changed the roles, but they haven't changed roles in just Snow. They've changed roles in, in Cowers. And I don't, I'll be honest, some of the ideas right now seem a little bit muddled because of the positioning that these guys are playing. Uh, and I, I give you a very good example. So we spoke about on sort of case the Snow on Inferno, he'd play sort of like this rotate role. He'd be long, he'd rotate over towards B if there was an issue. He'd kind of be the guy going in guaranteeing the round he doesn't play that anymore on inferno he's now sort of short anchor pit anchor uh, and he kind of interchanges whether he's short or whether he's pit uh, and cowers now plays the role of rotate on inferno oh, sorry on mirage snow has taken cowers's position directly off him and he now plays short which is more of a star rifler you kind of want your rifler to do well cowers is now a anchor so you're actually blending the two players together to a point where some of them on their more comfortable maps, I guess, are in star roles. And on the other hand, some of them are in more supportive anchor roles. And for me, that is a little bit confusing because they have to kind of get out of one mindset of can I do this? Can I do that? On CT side, can I take this risk? I don't know because I'm, I'm supposed to be out. I'm supposed to be holding the site down. Can I make this play? Um, uh, and then sometimes, if you're in a best of three, for example, you've got Inferno Mirage in the pool. On, on one end of things, you've got Snow that is going to be dictating the pace. And on the other hand, you've got Cowers that can rotate and sort of pop off and Snow be sitting in pit for 15 rounds. I guess 12 rounds now, so yes, two. But, but you get my point. It, it, it feels a little bit disjointed, but they're trying to accommodate both players. And also what's interesting is you take a look at Biggie Zero's style of calling, it isn't just uh, aggressive. He's very much my, one of those South American IGLs that wants things to be a lot more methodical. He wants things to take time and develop naturally into the round, and he can be a lot more reactive. And that doesn't really blend properly sometimes into the way that uh, Cowers and Snow in particular, I think, would want to play. But they are molding, they are adjusting to it. But that is why you've seen a downward trend in Snow's performance at the moment, if you take a look statistically on rating. But it's because he's now kind of having a merged role with Cowers, and he's also swapped a lot of positions up. And also Payne in general, they've swapped positions up. So that's going to take a little bit more time for them to kind of understand and integrate all of the players into the roster completely. If you take a look into your crystal ball, though, do you think that they keep doing this, or is it going to be something that they're going to have to shelve at some point? I think they'll shelve it. I think it's a, a short-term fix to a, a, a problem that is probably a nice one to have. 
because you've got two players that can just perform very well. But yeah, I, I mean, it makes more sense for the roles to be clearly defined. But uh, people could even argue, hey, what what is a role in CS anymore? Because you don't have your, your stereotypical uh, entries. Now everyone just kind of entries. You don't have your set lurkers unless you're in sort of like the top five teams. Like there, it isn't cut and dry anymore. There's a lot more black and white and there's a lot more gray area, which means that there's a lot more room for creativity. And Pain can get away with doing that in a domestic scene because it feels like they're going to win all their games anyway. So this is a nice time to kind of figure it out and test it. He's only been on the team two months. Um, people can immediately go, he's been on the team two months. That's such a long time. It, it isn't. <laughs> in the grand scheme of things, it isn't really. No, it's really not. Also, I think for a young player, it's really important to be able to show that you can change your roles up. Because I, I think that that adaptability becomes very attractive later on when you're looking for other teams that maybe if you want to leave or you want to get bought out, it is attractive if you know that this player is able to be a bit multifaceted, surely. Because I think that there was a really interesting conversation on Twitter. I've actually brought this up before on another show where Pimp said that, where he was like, we're putting too much emphasis on roles and positions. Like you need to be able to adapt. You need to change. Like that's kind of, that's an attractive uh, characteristic, if you like, of a pro player, not someone who's completely stuck in one place and can't change to better the team. I, I think it's more the case of, I think now when you're looking at players, you're looking at whether they can take ownership of a round. If they can understand the there's an opportunity here to potentially win the round if I go and take initiative. Or it's probably best if I sit back and let the team work somewhere else, but I'm still being cognizant of all the different possibilities around me. I think it's ownership, and I think it's almost shared responsibility that are now attractive qualities for players. And it's, again, I still, I will probably say this every episode, but I think it is wild that we are talking about these qualities in players that are so young like it is fantastic right. to me that we get no but you know what i mean like we, we've got donk we've got manasi in tier one that are tearing it up these guys have like are just so young uh, and now we're talking about snow who began his professional campaign obviously a, a few years ago as a streamer and now he's like 17 it's it's really interesting because they have got so many years to develop. They might even have another iteration of the game to go through. Like that's the longevity of these careers, which is why it's really interesting to talk about them now, right at the beginning stages. That's the thing, because they could be going on for another like 10 years. It's fascinating to me that it's still... And, and watching them change up their style as well, I think will be quite exciting. Getting back to, to Snow, though, so he makes the move to Payne. You've, you've seen him now there for two months. Do you think it was the right move for him in terms of his yeah. career trajectory? I think so. I think you're, you're currently under one of the best IGLs in the domestic scene in Big Uzira. Um, I think that you've got really talented players around you. You've got experienced players in NQZ and Lux. Lux is now performing well above his weight ever since he, he got that move to Payne which is really good because it's not just you don't come into this team thinking I need to be the guy. It is everyone can step up when it matters. And it's also, I think, a really good sort of dimension. I don't know the, I don't know the intrinsic nature of teams. I don't know sort of the emotional background. I'm only speculating, but I can imagine it's really nice for Snow to follow in the footsteps of someone like Cowers, who's now been there a year, has also come from an academy team. Cowers actually went the express route. He skipped a couple of tiers of CS. He went straight from the academy team straight in towards pain. Think about the amount of pressure he was under. So he knows how to manage it. He knows how to experience it. So he can be there as sort of, not a mentor, because the guy's 21, but he can be there as a support network. And then suddenly you've got support networks that form almost a hierarchy, but they're also operating uh, a little bit similar to a family where everyone is in it together. Okay, B Dog, I think we've we've spoken a lot about Snow. We've seen where he's gone, we've seen where he's going. I gotta ask you that big question. Now I need you to sell me this pro. Sure. Uh you should invest <laughs> if we're doing that. <laughs> in in Snow, because he's proven himself in sort of tier two, tier three SA, has got the call up to now a big team in pain. 
is being trusted by one of the best IGLs in South America, has performed well despite changing roles, despite now getting pressure from a bigger organization. And the one thing he's going to have after uh, a little bit of time is stability. And if he was performing that well, if he was that noticed already in the likes of Young Gods, in the likes of Los Grandes, when there were issues, and he's still 17 years old, he's managed all of that expectation. He's been picked up an unconventional route by streaming and then going into a professional Counter-Strike career, and he's made it work to the point where he's in one of the best teams in South America, all whilst sort of changing roles, adapting to a new style of play it isn't just hold w let's go and get the win it's hey let's think about this a little bit more and he's still doing well and there's still room for him to grow there's still room for him to evolve in his roles there's now going to be opportunities on the open circuit next year where we're going to be seeing a lot more of them and now he's going to get his opportunity to play against teams that are better more experienced international from europe and Payne did all right at the major so i i would definitely say they're on an upswing he's on an upswing it's definitely worth looking at so based on that i mean i'm feeling very confident here am i putting all my money into this am i going to take everything i have to spend and back this one or or are we playing it safe and, and maybe keeping a little bit of the cash to the side just in case we're always playing it safe because you never know in esports. <laughs> I don't think it's a good idea in esports to invest your money into just one thing. So uh, I would Some say... Some would argue investing in esports in general is a bad thing these days. Of but course I mean, not. That's and, a whole uh, other uh, another, podcast. <laughs> uh, it's a whole other episode. Um, but, but also, we are not financial advisors. However, for the sake of, <laughs> sake of this, I would say that you could be a, a little bit more confident in the the longevity of this player's career rather than just a flash in the pan that's amazing so you rate him quite highly even though he's not even 18 yet seven it's what he's had like two three years of competitive play for us to to go on that's insane yeah i i, I just <laughs> i've seen enough of his games and it's one of those where uh, the audience will either side with me or not side with me based on the fact i'm saying i've watched enough of the guys demos i know he can grow into a better player and he's already performing very well and he's on a lineup that i think can make that happen for him as exactly. well there we go we've got snow we'd yeah we've, we've decided snow snow is a, a smart spend that's the route you want to go what do you think you can let us know in the comments and also if there's a player that you've been watching whether you rate them or hate them let us know we'll we'll possibly have a little look-see at them and, and maybe B-Dog can jump into the demos and tell us what he's thinking. But we will be back for another episode. You still got stacks of players lined up, right? Yeah, yeah, we've got a few in the pipeline. So we've got a few. More B-Dog has a whole list. Well. I've read... Yeah, for a, lot of, a lot of South America is coming up, so I know all our Brazil fans are going to be excited about that. We'll see you for the next episode.